Praise God. Hey, can we give Jesus another round of applause for all that he's done? Amen. Amen. It's uh, wonderful to be here with you, and I uh, just want to say thank you to all the team uh, that have helped in this process of renaming our church and really the heart behind it. So would you give it up for all the team that actually produced? Come on, you can do, it's a lot of work. Let's thank them. Amy, Carter, all our staff. And let's thank the worship for that great worship today. You guys are awesome, amazing. How y'all doing, hey? Welcome to Fountain. It's good to be here. I get the honor of uh, sharing a word with you as we enter into this new season and celebrating 10 years, but really dedicating the next uh, decade to him. And uh, we're, we're so thankful that the Lord opened the heavens and we literally walked here in a fount. <laughs> uh, yeah, good, good dad jokes. That's good. Showing my age. Um, but uh, before I get into the word, would we stand to our feet? And I want, I know you connected already, but there's more people that you can connect with, and th there is a lot of people here. And I love fellowship, I love connection. So find uh, one person and let them know. When, when did you come along to C3? If it's your first time, if it's your first time, then you can let them know. But tell them when you came along to C3, now found. Go, go say hi. <laughs> If you met someone nice, give me a wave. Give me a wave if you met someone nice. That's great. Apologies if the person next to you is not waving. My wife woke up at, I think it was around 4 a.m., and we'd been praying and talking and just feeling like, okay, Lord, you're, you've got a, a new name for us. And we couldn't land on anything. Just a few, few times we were like close with some things. Um, but I don't know if the Lord woke her up or she was just up. But she started to research some old hymns. And this word popped up in these two hymns that we sung today, Fount. And then I woke up about midday. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the and she she told me the hey I think I think I've got the name and she said found and it immediately just hit my heart and I was like that's it that's it done cool <laughs> so we sent a text to the team and that was it that was great <laughs> um, but I just want to honor my wife because uh, without yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, not just for the name, but really the last 10 years, uh, this church is what it is. And just her sacrifice, her prayers, um, just her support of our family through some really up and down moments, dark times, good times, 
and uh, with, without, without her, that I wouldn't be here. And so I just want to honor Georgie today. Would you just give it up for my beautiful wife, Georgie, today? Yeah, come on, let's love on her. <laughs> we love you, Georgie, I love you. And I, I, I don't know if Brooks and Zeph are in here, but I honor you as my two sons. And uh, just so proud of you, uh, the men that you're becoming, all that you've uh, already walked through in this wild, crazy city and this uh, crazy journey. I think Brooks said this morning as we're getting ready, the church is one year younger than me. <laughs> He's, he's 11, and uh, yeah, we, he was six months old when we started this church, and it's just, just so beautiful to see him grow up as the, as the church has grown as well. Really cool. If you have your Bibles here today, Exodus chapter 17, there's just so many people to, to thank, and obviously it'd be very easy for me to get extremely emotional, but I'll spare all the visitors for that. Like, wow, this guy's... He cries a lot, yeah. <laughs> Exodus 17 verse 1 says this, Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin according to the command of the Lord and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Everyone say, no water. <laughs> the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. If you have a, if you've been around young kids, when they are hungry or thirsty, you know exactly what verse two sounds like. So the people are whinging, they're, they're quarreling. It also kind of reminds me of you and I when we are not getting what we think we need. Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt? Remember, Egypt's the place where they've been enslaved for 400 years. It's amazing how we reminisce on our past because of our current thirst. How we glorify something that actually was way worse than where we are now just because right now we're dry brought us up from Egypt to kill us. So dramatic. So much drama in our lives. Every day, it's like so much drama. But it, I love this re reflection and parallel to humanity. And our children and our livestock with thirst. So, my, Mo, so Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do to this people? A little more, and they will stern me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. And take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. And you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massah and Mirabah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Paul references this story in 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 4, and he says that that rock that Moses struck was Christ. So we see that the type of is clear. The picture is clear. This was a rock in a wilderness. And Christ for us is a rock in a weary land called New York City. A rock speaks of shelter, safety, durability, and strength. But when you're in a dry place, it's interesting that a rock doesn't seem that interesting. If you're extremely thirsty, a rock is probably the first thing you're going to walk past when you're thirsty. So it's with that in mind that this passage reveals a few things to us as we enter into this next season as a church and officially become found. The first thing I want to highlight is that there is a condition of desperate need. 
This passage reveals to us that every single person in this room and in this city and in this nation and obviously across the globe, that every single human soul without Christ is in desperate need. And we see it every day in the news. We see it across every status of class. We see it in every nook and cranny of every culture and subculture. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how you dress. Doesn't matter what your educational pedigree is. Doesn't matter what kind of car you drive or whether you've never owned a car. The reality is that every single human being is in a condition of desperate need. And we see this because the people of God it says that they dwelt in a barren place. It says in verse one, there was no water. We all know how important water is, but we take it for granted every day. We, we turn the tap on and we go to Dwayne Reed and buy our water or we, 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 we have water on tap, so to speak. But if you're in a desert, if you're in a dry place and you don't have a well or a cistern or some sort of place that's holding water, and you start to feel thirsty, you could imagine the anxiety that begins to rise. When you have millions of people that have come out of slavery and you have livestock and children, can you imagine as a parent going, um, where is this leader taking us? Uh, Moses, what are you doing? You can't complain them from grumbling because they haven't drank in, in probably days by now. They're getting to that point where it's kind of life or death. We know that after three days, that, that, that's a very critical point in terms of hydration levels. So there is some urgency. And that's what I sense in our generation. There is some urgency in people's spirit that there is a desperate need. There is a dryness. There is a sense that we know we're in a barren land. We just don't know how to solve it. And we're complaining to our leaders. We're complaining to those that we've followed into that place going, hey, what are you going to do about it? What are, you, what are you going to do? And Moses said, why, why are you testing the Lord? Have you not seen what he did in Egypt? He's, he's going to provide. And Moses had some sort of assurance. He didn't know how, but he does something that's really powerful. He cries out to the Lord. See, the world of itself can never supply the wants of your human soul. Doesn't matter what the world comes up with, the next thing, doesn't matter how much wealth, riches, abundance we have from a worldly point of view, it will still not satisfy that part of our soul. Jeremiah 2 verse 13 says this, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns broken cisterns that cannot hold water. A cistern was actually uh, usually dug in a Jewish home in the courtyard. And so it was obviously under the open sky. And so if it did rain, they were catching as much of the water as possible. So they had something to, to kind of hold that water. The, the issue is if, I don't know if you've ever, you know, dug a hole in the sand at the beach and water fills it eventually that water just seeps back into the ground. And that's essentially what would happen. It would hold water for, for a little bit, but it would eventually either evaporate or dry up and just creep into any open crevice or rock in that cistern. And in this time for Jeremiah, he's actually likening, and the Lord's likening and paralleling their cisterns to their worship. Because they had turned away from God, they now turn to idols. And he calls their idols, in comparison to him, broken cisterns. And I'm here to remind us as we enter into this new season, and this could be the moment for a heart or a soul, one person here today where you say, I'm going to turn away from the places that do not satisfy me, and I'm going to begin to turn back to the living water. See, if you were fortunate, fortunate enough to have a living spring, a spring of water near your house, you didn't need a cistern. A cistern was because you didn't have a spring near your house. And so you're just hoping that you'll survive from some level of rainfall. And sure enough, it would not satisfy. It would not suffice. And so it is in our life. Your idol worship in 2023, has it satisfied you? Or has it dried up? That is the, the question as we enter in to this next season as a church are we going to the places that are broken, 
cisterns that are broken, when we literally in front of us here today by the presence of God, because of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and the power of his resurrection, we now have access to the Holy Spirit, who is this spring of living water. He is available to each of us. See, in the chaos leading up to the French Revolution in 1789 to 99, many churches in France converted into, so these are Christian churches honouring Christ, turned into what they called temples of reason. People lifted up the goddess of reason to celebrate the new age of reason in place of the fading age of faith. Not long afterward, the age of romanticism came along to replace the tyranny of reason by lifting up passions and feelings. So the church went from faith in Christ, and obviously it wasn't just an immediate switch, but, but slid into a place because they weren't really uh, being satisfied in Christ, they were being satisfied in the form, a form of godliness, in ritual, in the sense of religion versus the person of Christ. And over time, because of the lack of grace and reliance on the Holy Spirit, the church slid into reason. But it's interesting that reason then slid into feelings, the age of romanticism. And, and really, this is the, the cycle of humanity. This is human history. And so it is now in our generation that perhaps we've slid into even a greater level of feeling, even a greater level of, uh, of a mix of things, like a pendulum swinging back and forth, each age has its own ideology. Sometimes there's a good reason for the change because of government structures, because of disaster, because of economic crisis. But usually only one side of truth is exalted. And when that becomes idolized, it prompts a reaction. There's a place for reason. There's a place for emotions. There's a place for art. There's a place for science and much more. There's a place in this city for all of those things. And God and the church should not be against reason and emotion and art and beauty because all good things flow from this fount. The reality is they just aren't the fount. They're good but they're not good enough. And they really have no life of their own unless they are connected to life itself. But when people highlight ideals over the sovereignty of God, they become idols, false gods, and are eventually found to be inadequate. Idols are ultimately unsatisfying church. That is what happened in the days of Jeremiah. My people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols, said the Lord. Do we not live in such an age where a constant exchange is being taken place, where we elevate self above the self-maker? They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot. He didn't say they might hold water, cannot hold water. Like idols, broken cisterns leave us thirsty. Some of us here recognize that thirst. And I believe all of us today can be humbled and say, you know what, I am in need of a true source of living water. Regardless of what people may say from age to age, throughout history, Jesus is always the living water who fills us with the gift of eternal life. See, separated from the cross of Christ, our abode or our living place is wasted places. That's what the wilderness speaks of. They were disobedient to God. They formed their own idols and found themselves wandering in a place of dryness. And God is so gracious to us and to them that He continually provides for us, but He doesn't want us to live in barren places anymore. He wants the city of New York to live in His place of living water, having access to His life every single day. Is this not the call of you and I? If we are not connected to the living source, if we're not connected to Him, how can we offer a dry and thirsty world a place to drink? 
See, the second thing that we notice is that their souls were thirsty. Not only were they in a barren place, but, but they were people that thirsted, it said in verse three. Can I say today that there is nothing wrong with thirst? See, I don't know about you, but the, the times in this uh, journey with Christ, and I'm particularly reflecting on the last 10 years, of course, here, but the times that I have been uh, barren or in a dry place, I now bless those times because those are the times that cause me to cry out for true living water. I remember a time where I was stressing out Georgie, which is kind of depends what time of day it is. And I, I, we were like three weeks, four weeks into the church plant. And I, I was all of a sudden just felt the overwhelming sense of like, this is just way too hard. I don't know why I'm here. I want to move back to Manly Beach in Sydney. I lived a block from the beach. I could surf every day. It was, it was man, it was a great life. <laughs> And I'm like, why did you bring me here, Lord? This is a dry and barren place. I was complaining. I was whinging. I was just like, and George is like, I am sick of this. Get out of here. She was my Moses. <laughs> She's like, get out there and seek God. And so I kind of, you know, reluctantly walked out the door and kind of started to pray around the blocks of Williamsburg. Anyone from Brooklyn here? Come on. And I'm circling the blocks. I remember, I, I think it was North Six and Berry. That's holy ground if you ever want to walk past there. <laughs> and the Lord spoke to me. So the, the first prayers were like, you know, you, maybe some of you can relate, just kind of so pitiful. <laughs> like, not, really, not really honest initially, just like, you know, kind of fake prayers. And then I just felt, no, be real. Let, let your cry come out. I started to cry out to God. And as soon as I started to cry, it was like I tapped into living water because I was acknowledging that I was thirsty. See, when you have fake prayers, you're saying, I'm satisfied. But when you're real in your prayer, you're saying, God, I'm thirsty. I need you. I cannot make it through another day of parenting. I can't make it through another day of this stupid job. I, I can't make it a day through this city and all the things that happen to you. It, God sees all that and He's not judging you for your thirst. But he, wa he wants a church that's real. He wants a church that reaches out and says, God, I know that all these things are not my fount. You are my fount. You are my source. You are the place that I find life. And so when I got real, that's when I tapped into something. Isn't it amazing? And so the Lord spoke to me two things that changed the trajectory of my life and, and the church that we were planting. He said, it will be according to your prayer. See, prayer is the greatest example of you believing in God's grace. You get up in the morning and you're saying things that you have nothing to do with. And God moves on your behalf. Is there another greater sign of grace than that? You pray for someone's healing and they get healed. You pray for someone's salvation and he moves. You pray for provision and he provides. I'm not saying faith without works, faith without works is dead, but I'm saying that as your work is to rest and to lean into him and to acknowledge your thirst, that's the greatest work where you actually say, God, I rely on you. You are what sustains me. And at that point, he said, it will be according to your prayer. And I realized, wow, this is all on grace. This is not up to my own strength. This is not up to flesh. This is up to your spirit. Your spirit can move. And the second thing he said, one divine connection a day. And that changed everything. You know why? Because I was approaching the city like I was gonna save the city in a day. I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's literally how many church planners think or church leaders. It's like, you're looking at the whole city. You're like, how can I get everyone saved? And God's like, you're weird. <laughs> Jesus didn't even do that. <laughs> He saw the person in front of them. When's the last time you actually noticed the Uber driver, noticed the taxi driver, noticed the barista, noticed the waiter, noticed the colleague, noticed that friend? And stop getting in your head about what they're gonna say to you or what they're gonna notice about you and actually be present enough to actually give them living water. 
See, presence is the greatest sign that your thirst has been satisfied. If you're thirsty, you're, you're just, you can't think about anyone else because you're thirsty. I, I just got to get water. But once you tap into Christ, your thirst is satisfied. Now you can be a living well for others. When you're self-focused, that is a great sign of thirst. Remember that. And don't be judged by that, but realize I've got to connect to Christ because self is like a dry cistern with no water and digging deeper as if you're going to hit water. There's no spring there. It's only in Christ. And so he said, one divine connection day. And I want to reclaim that. Imagine every single person in this room said, you know what, I just want to have one present moment where I can share about Jesus being my fount or pay for their coffee or invite them to church or pray for healing. Imagine if we all just said one a day and that's what began to happen. I realized over 365 days, that's 365 people personally that I can impact. That's a great church. Because I was trying to rely on team and everyone else and think, oh, how's this all going to happen? But when I just focused and said, you know, what? I just want to impact 365 people, one a day this year. However many people in here, that's like 365,000 people this year that we can impact just from this room. Oh, come on, let's give it up. Like, that's what you can do. But it's not a pastor's job. It's not a paid staff member's job. It's every believer in the house of God in Fount saying, I'm going to be living water. I'm going to offer them a drink of something that will truly satisfy them. Just being present, looking. And, and here today, I'm, I'm so excited that here today, Georgie and my first divine connection, which happened the next day after that prayer, her name is Damaris. And she's sitting over here. Stand up, Damaris. Come on. And her sister Priscilla, right there. Stand up, Priscilla. Amazing family. We honor you guys today. They have been with us from the beginning. But I love telling that story because through this amazing family, I think we can trace like 500 people that found out, and probably more now, 500 people plus that came to church because of that first divine connection. See, I could have done it in my own strength, but one moment of being present ended up turning that whole situation around, and then Damaris began to reach Brooklyn. <laughs> but can you see the grace of it? You could try and reach everyone. You can try and you know, build the business of your dream. You could try to do all these different things, but God has a plan. God has a way, and God wants you to follow His ways today, and you'll, you'll discover the miracle power of faith as you place your trust in Jesus. They were thirsty, and I was thirsty in that prayer moment, and I was satisfied by those two words. And I want you to get that in your heart as we enter the next 10 years. It's according to our prayer and one divine connection a day. Be present today. Look for an opportunity to invite someone into the house of God, into dinner parties, into, into your world, and love on them. Many divine connections I have never came to church, and that's okay, but I know I sowed a seed for the future. And so be bold, but be wise. Be filled with faith. But make sure you don't hold back this living water. The next thing that we notice is that it was an unexpected source of supply. It says in verse 6, There shall come out water. Out of what? You think about it, you're walking around a desert, everyone's thirsty, it's dry, sandy, and there's this like, this rock. If, if there's anything that you're gonna think, okay, that's where our answer's gonna be. It's not there. It's not, it's not from a dry rock. I've never opened up a rock and I found water. I used to, you know those quartz rocks? I used to hammer them just to see the cool, I thought it was like really valuable crystals. And, but I never found water once. See, worldly wisdom could not by any amount of searching find out this method. 
There's, there's no amount of human wisdom that would say, okay, well, we've got, all, we've got millions of people thirsty. Let's hit this rock. I, I want you to catch this today. See, if we're going to try and satisfy our thirst and we think by our genius or our earthly wisdom or by following other earthly leaders that somehow they're going to lead us to a place that's truly going to satisfy us, we'll be sorely mistaken. I, I, I love, you know, listening to all the podcasts and, and hearing all these amazing uh, minds that God created and, and, and hearing from them. But unless these people are actually ultimately leading us to the rock of Christ, we will find ourselves thirsty. It doesn't matter how high the wisdom level is, it may help us in certain areas, but it's not going to help us in the area of our soul. So I'm not discrediting there is, a, there is a place for earthly wisdom. It's just not for our soul in the sense of it's not going to satisfy our heart. And, and if we do that, we'll find, us, find ourselves in a position where we're always disappointed. We move on to the next job. We move on to the next get rich thing. We get, move on to the next person. We move on to the next date. Why? Because we're thinking that this one, this thing, this level of wisdom is going to satisfy and there's no way the people of God said, this had to come from God. It, it came from a rock. John 1, 46, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? See, people did not see Jesus as the answer. It's like, how, how could this carpenter's boy be the, be the answer? Isaiah 55, verse 8 says, my ways are not as your ways, says the Lord. Constantly in Scripture, we see the, 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 the prophecies and the foreshadowing of Christ was that people were going to overlook Him. And so it is true today that there, there is this interesting thing where either the rock of Christ will be your stumbling block or it will be your fountain. There is no middle ground with Christ. Either He's everything for your soul or He's actually nothing. As in, you actually trip over him. He's a stumbling block to those who are not believing. He is this rock that we walk past. He is, see, people may not take notice to this gathering today. They didn't take notice when we're in a dinner party. But those that were thirsty and those that heard the invite and those that saw my stupid business card with dinner party on it <laughs> and said, yes, I've seen their life come alive in the source of Jesus Christ. <laughs> just because people walk past the church, just because people do not say yes to Jesus does not mean it is not satisfying for you. It's really important that you stop looking at where the world's running and think that you haven't found it yet. How many believers are living like through their screen or through their... Their, 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 their view of the world thinking, maybe I've missed it. I'm telling you today, the people of God here under Moses, as they saw this water flow out of a rock, they, had, they didn't have to go anywhere else. They'd found their source. They'd found their fountain. They found what they're looking for. Jesus is this unlimited, amazing source. And it came out of an unexpected place. It came from... A God-possessed rock. That's wild to me. He says, I will stand upon the rock. Pause and think of this. How suggestive is this of the incarnation of Christ? It's a foreshadowing of what Christ would do. That It was not the thought that God would save the world through the very thing that was fallen from God. Humanity. God put on flesh and dwelt amongst us. No one saw that coming. It was the rock you walked past in the desert. That God actually became like man who knew no sin to then deliver the whole world. And still people walk past him, but yet there's a living water flowing from this rock. See, 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, God was in Christ. God was in that rock, foreshadowing what was to come. God was in human, human form. 
namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. See, the rock in and of itself could do nothing. I want you to catch this today, church, front to back, left to right. The rock could do nothing in and of itself. That's what Jesus is talking about. Apart from me, you can do nothing. See, humanity is a rock. Humanity is is not the answer to humanity. It's just a rock. Oh, we're really thirsty. Oh, let's look to Elon Musk. Oh, we're really thirsty. Let's look to the president. Oh, we're really thirsty. Let's look to the celebrity. Oh, I'm really thirsty. Let's look to this person. Even your family. Oh, I'm really thirsty. My family will solve it. Oh, I'm really thirsty. My kids. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. It's all just dry rocks in a barren land until we realize it's God in humanity who dwelt amongst us, who is actually now the source of living water flowing into every life. Humanity is not the answer for humanity. Only God is the answer to humanity's deep issues. See, Acts 2.36 says, He is both Lord and and Christ. He is the answer. Now, how did, how did the water come out of this? This is so important. An unlikely means was used. The rock was to be smitten. Everyone say smitten. It's probably the first time you use that word this week. Watch it. Verse 6. You shall smite the rock. I know there's a few people in your life you want to smite you shall, smite, you shall smite the rock. See, this thought never originated in the heart of man, that salvation could be brought forth by smiting the anointed of God. There's no one that thought, you know what, if we kill God, that will provide living water for all generations. Only God could come up with that. But he was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53 verse 5. The sword must awake against the man that was God's fellow. Oh, worship the Lord. When the Lord was struck, what came out of him? Not wrath. Not judgment. When the Lord himself, who made you and I, who knows no sin, who has never made a mistake, when that rock was struck... It was not just dryness, it was water. When Christ was struck, when He was crucified, what flowed was forgiveness. What flowed was the very thing that no one thought could happen. When you kill God, He still forgives. It's time to walk away from our idols. There's no idol that you strike that's gonna then forgive you. There's no person that you strike and then they're gonna flow with living water. Only Christ, only Jesus is the answer. See, the rock was to be smitten with a rod. It says, your rod with which you smote the river, take in your hand. See, he, he was in Egypt and he, the rod went into the water and turned it to blood. What does this speak of? It says that this, as he hit the rock, the judgment did not fall on us, it fell on himself. He took on the judgment that you and I deserve. This is, this is the answer to your shame and your guilt. This is the answer to your condemnation. This is the answer to all your past mistakes. All of it has fallen upon Christ. Today, you can walk out of here free and forgiven and abundant in life. Oh, come on, church. You are free and forgiven in Christ. I felt like the Holy Spirit just brought to mind Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> he was that fount. <laughs> Sorry, Jets fans. I'm just, <laughs> you need Jesus today, and I want all Jets fans up on the altar today. <laughs> you need Jesus. <laughs> Whole jokes aside, I'm telling you, you need Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> the last. Last two thoughts here. A gracious, 
provision was made. See, the rock was hit, but it wasn't a trickle of water just for Moses. It wasn't just water for the elders. It wasn't just water for a few chosen leaders of the 12 tribes. The rock was hit and water that was abundant flowed from it. See, part of the church's problem has been offering a rock that does not have abundance. We offer a form of the gospel, but then treat people like there's a trickle. And now that time is done. That season is over. I declare over New York City abundant grace to flow into every household, every family, every relationship in Jesus' name. And you are the answer to that because if you receive Christ, you now have rivers of living water that bubble up with inside of you. What is this river, church? What are we talking about? This water, living water. You're new here. You're like found water. Okay, that's great. What are we talking? We're talking about the love of God. The soul needs love. Your heart needs to be loved. That's all. The, the problems in all of our life are because we look for love in the wrong place. And I'm here to tell you that the one that did not deserve it was struck. And it was not a trickle, but rather water flowed out of it. Abundant supply for millions of people. And it did not stop flowing. And here today... You can be guaranteed if your faith is in Christ, the one who was struck for you, the one that died for you, the, the one that was buried for you, the one that rose again for you, has an abundant supply of, of forgiveness, of living water, and now gives you access into the Holy Spirit. The supply was abundant. But not only was it abundant from the rock, no one set up a little merch stand and started charging for the water at the rock. It was a free supply. It was a free supply. Your forgiveness costs you nothing, but costs Him everything. And just because it costs someone so much, don't devalue the cost. Just because grace is free, just because forgiveness is free, don't minimize the most important thing that will ever happen for the human soul, that you now have eternal life and can live with this hope that's an anchor to your soul that carries you into everlasting life. His name is Jesus. But just because it costs you nothing, don't forget the cost of Jesus Christ. So often we don't drink from this well because we love drinking from wells that cost us. We love drinking from places that we aren't. We love drinking from our own wealth. We love drinking from our own fame and success, thinking that it will satisfy us. Why? Because we had something to do with it. That's the trick of grace. <laughs> it's the, the mystery of the gospel is that we had nothing to do with it, but it's so often this rock that we bypass. It's so often the place that we don't go because it had nothing to do with our effort. Today, all those things that you're achieving, no one's belittling them. All I'm saying is it will not save you. Stop pretending that your job, your career, your dream will save you. Stop pretending that someone else in your life will save you. The only one that can save you is the one that was struck. See church, the rock became a fount and the fount is now available for all of humankind. If you wanna receive Jesus Christ, if you wanna receive Him today, it is an abundant supply and it is a free supply. I love this, Isaiah 55 verse one. He, everyone that thirsts, come to you without money and without price. Just come as you are today, literally, just come as you are and drink of who He is. If you've been in church your whole life, just come as you are. So often we're trying to purchase God's love because we're serving. So often we're trying to purchase God's love because we have a pedigree of people that went before us that were Christian. None of that is why we drink from Him. We drink from Him because we're thirsty. 
And so many people that have grown up in church are so thirsty because they haven't really drunk from Christ. They're relying on their parents' faith. They're relying on their heritage. They're relying on the fact that they went to Bible college. None of that means we're drinking from Christ. Today's the day that matters. Today's the day that matters. If you've fallen away from God, today you can come back and drink from Him. If you've never said yes to Jesus and you're trying to find yourself, you're trying to drink from broken cisterns, you're trying to find yourself in idols and all the things of this world, let me tell you, you're just like these Israelites, you're just like me, as we're wandering around the desert looking and complaining about our thirst, this rock is struck and water flows out of it. It's a miracle called Christ. And today you can receive the free abundant supply of grace and love, everything your heart is looking for. Will you bow your heads, close your eyes here as we do the most important thing of today is that every heart has an opportunity to come back to living water. Every heart has an opportunity to come back to the fount who is Christ. As we start this new season, let's recommit our lives or say yes to Him for the first time. I believe today is so important. With everyone praying, I want you to ask your heart this question and humble yourself today. Am I drinking? from the rock? Am I drinking from Christ or am I drinking from self or the things of this world? God does not judge you for drinking from another place. He just loves you enough to say, I don't want you thirsty. That will not satisfy you. If my son was drinking from a dirty well, I would be loving enough as a father to say, hey, I've got a different source for you. And so it is with God today in this place by His Holy Spirit. He convicts us of sin, not to make us feel bad, but to call us back to living water. My job is not to convict you of sin, it's the Holy Spirit's job. But if you know you're not living right with the Lord today, start afresh with Him and come back to the fount. If your life does not speak of His glory and His holiness and His righteousness, don't feel judged, but don't stay in that place. Say yes to Him. It's only the fount of His blood that can wash you clean. Wash all your sins white as snow. As far as east is from west, He'll remember your sins no more. I know you remember them, but I'm telling you, God forgives all and receives you and satisfies your soul. If you want that kind of satisfaction, on the count of three, lift your hand across this place. Most importantly, because your heart is saying yes. I want you to lift your hand because your heart is saying yes to Jesus, the fount. You're coming back to Him. One, two, three. Just lift your hand and say, Josh, that's me. Amen, amen. Hands all over this place saying, I'm humbling myself today and I'm coming back to Him. I'm getting my life right with the Lord. There are more hands right now. Just say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Him today. Come back to the rock. Don't walk past this. Don't let Jesus be a stumbling block. Rather, kneel before Him. Kneel before Him and drink. Drink from this everlasting life. Drink from this amazing source of forgiveness and freedom. Lift your hand today to say, Josh, that's me, I'm coming back. I'm turning away from the broken cisterns. I'm turning away from all the wells that I've dug, which have dried up. Today I drink from you. I'm satisfied by you alone. Who else is there today? If there's one more hand, two more hands, just lift your hand and say, Josh, I'm not gonna walk out of this place without saying yes to Jesus, amen. Amen. Who else is there today? Say, Josh, that's me. I wanna come back. Just come, friend. Just lift your hands. I wanna come back to Him. I'm saying yes to Him, amen. You can look this way, church. So cool to see hearts responding. Why don't we stand to our feet and we're gonna pray together. We have a moment of prayer, moment of worship, and I, we're gonna then dedicate and pray over us as a church that we are now found church, which is gonna be awesome. So stay with us a little longer because it's an important moment of dedication. But before we dedicate the, this next season to the Lord, I wanna pray for every heart that lifted their hand. And I wanna pray for all of us to respond to this message today. Right now, let's bow our heads and close our eyes in prayer. We say these words up to me. Let's say it as found family right now together. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, 
forgive me from drinking from sources that will never satisfy. I come back to you today. You are my fountain. You are living water. Let your blood forgive me and wash away every sin. I receive it. I am thirsty, but I want to be satisfied in you alone. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and rising again to give me the Holy Spirit. Now I receive rivers of living water to flow through me every single day. Your love is what I need. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, come on, let's give God some praise for, for all these souls. Come on, let's worship God. Let's praise Him. Amen. 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 Now let's lift our hands as a church family. Lord, let this reality come on, all hands united. God commands a blessing. Where there's unity, I just pray for unity in this place. I thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing right now. God, yes, for those that receive Christ, but for all of us that have our faith in you, we just pray right now for a reconnection to the Holy Spirit through Christ. I thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would bubble up inside of us. Lord, that we begin to pray again. God, we begin to devote ourselves to the Word of God again. A new hunger for the well, a new hunger for living water every morning, every day, not just on Sundays, but every single day at dinner parties, all the way through to Sundays. We thank you, Lord, every location, every place will be filled with living water because the believers are alive. We thank you, Lord. We are satisfied in you alone. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's sing this chorus. Come on. as a church and so right now as part of that presentation would you turn your eyes to the screen as we uh, watch this video the church is about people encountering Christ it's about God's powerful transformative love entering our lives and filling us with new life truth, grace, and freedom. Over the past 10 years as a church, we have seen God do what only God can do, time and time again. We have seen the miracle of salvation, eyes being opened to who God is, 
and entering into new relationship with him. We have seen the miracle of healing, both physical and emotional. We've heard countless testimonies of God's transformative healing power. We have seen marriages formed, children birthed, families established. We have seen personal goals and dreams become reality as God brings vision and strategy in answered prayer. We have seen miracles of provision amidst dire situations. We have seen relationships healed and reconciled. We have seen voices of prayer rise in godly conviction, standing in the gap for our city and its future. We have seen strangers become friends and friends become family. The church is God's miraculous, alive body, His Spirit working in us, His blood sanctifying us, His truth enlightening us. There are too many stories to tell, but they remain forever in our heart, stirring us to faith as we recall the great things He has done. If you would have told me that night as a 17 year old that I would come back almost 10 years later with a husband with two daughters and that we'd be leading the Manhattan location, I would have thought you would be crazy. I got saved at a church called C3 Long Island. Um, and the crazy thing is that that church is actually the church that Pastor Josh Kelsey's dad planted. And because Pastor Josh and Georgie had a connection, and they came to our church, and I remember the video, it was like, C3, Brooklyn, 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 and now it's found. But Pastor Josh and Jordy came up and they got to share the vision of the church, and they said, hey, we're coming, um, and we're planting this church in the heart of Brooklyn. And I was like, I just wanna be there. So I remember showing up to um, the first dinner party, it was in Brooklyn, we had dinner together, and then we got to pray over the vision of the church. And um, it's just really cool, because now as I'm thinking back, those prayers that I was praying as a 17-year-old in this room, I didn't know a lot of people, um, I would have never guessed that God would bring us back here. And now 10 years later, we get to continue that vision. And because I just started working on Sundays, um, my whole concept was that as long as my wife and kids were in a safe space, I was fine for them to venture on their own until I get my bare means with work. I think it was Eleanor and Liam. They said, hey, why doesn't dad come to church? But they didn't know that I worked. So I was like, okay, I gotta sacrifice this now. Cause now they see it. Even though in my mind, they're gonna be in kids church. I'm gonna be upstairs next to my wife and I'm gonna go to sleep and she's gonna rub my back. I'm like, okay, get up. And then, but as long as my kids saw that I went to church, I went home with them, that was impactful. So I made it in my business and priority too make that happen, regardless of my work schedule. Mm -hmm. Growing up in the church, people would say, oh, let's hang out, or let me get your number and I'll call you. And we were used to that. We were just used to being around people and, and connected people. But not always did someone say that they were going to call you, called you. Yeah. And I will never forget, I met Kathy Wilder. Yeah. And uh, I was just like, oh my gosh, she's amazing. She's so sweet. They're so different from us. And she's like, give me your number, I'm going to call you. And she called me and I was shocked. I was like, she doesn't even know me, she's a stranger. But she didn't just call me once, she kept calling me and she kept calling me and she followed up. And she was like, you gotta get into the dinner party, you gotta come to our house, we gotta get our families together, we gotta do life together. That's how we got connected. That's how we got tricked into doing dinner party. Um, <laughs> as Kathy had our house over for sale. Yeah. And she was like, Nisha, I really need a really big favor. I just want you to host dinner party one time. And that's it. And I was like, okay, I have to ask Carmelo because Wednesday night was his only night off of the week. And that was our night to be with each other, family. So it was just like, oh, I don't know how this is going to impact the house. And he was just like very reluctant yeah. because he is a very neat freak. And he was like, people come in the house, make it a mess, kids, dinner. And we did it one time that first time. And I don't think it stopped for about <laughs> two years. Didn't and it grew. So we had an eight foot fold out dining table. And I would rearrange every other Wednesday the whole apartment and take the living room that was the bigger part of the apartment and make it the dining room 
so there can be one table that we can all sit together and break bread at. But we met so many amazing yeah. people and our kids were just so elated to do this with us. Um, it's huge, um, but we really honor you guys. These guys went to uh, Philadelphia to actually pass to these amazing people down there, and they uh, just said yes, and that that was really a powerful time. And now they're back with us, so we honor you, Kevin and Catherine. We love you guys so much. Hey, I'm gonna welcome up my wife, Georgie. And um, I'd love for all of us to stand. We're going to close in prayer as we dedicate Fount Church. And I want to actually just, this um, was really strong as I was thinking and praying about today. I, I want to welcome up uh, Damaris and Priscilla. I want to welcome up uh, Rashad, who's here and moved back to New York coming? City. Rashad, come up. Um, I'd love uh, Fillmore and Caitlin to come up. And... Um, all of our staff, Amy and Jay, and just anyone that's on staff, and also uh, Janelle and JP, uh, uh, Frankie and Jenny, David Chan. Um, yeah, keep clapping all these amazing heroes of this house. Um, Paula, Matthew. Mike. Mike, and yeah, Mike, come up. Uh, Dwight was on our staff. You can step forward. Um <laughs> John and Natalie, just all, all the team. Would you honor these amazing... Trish and Sam, Trish. come on. So many people. Yes. Incredible. So good. And so we want to, as an amazing... You guys can squeeze together the Red, the red Sea. <laughs> um... I thought it'd be cool to have all these incredible people because you guys represent also David and Tamika. Is Tamika here? She's probably looking after little ones. But if Tamika, right Tamika, come. Oh, you got baby. Yes. Can you go that way? Rashad, make sure she doesn't. Awesome. Come on, give Tamika an amazing hand. Worship, worship leader, mom of three. But yeah, these guys represent so many lives that have been changed because it's through them shepherding, pastoring, believing. And then also, if you're a dinner party leader, would you give us a wave right yes. now? Come on, we honor you guys. Come on. If you're on Dream Team, would you give us a wave? You volunteer, amazing. So cool. So right now, as a family, we want to reach out our hands to God and we want to dedicate and say thanks to God for 10 years, but now officially found church. What a beautiful moment to do it. Let's lift our hearts to Him. And uh, Georgie, let's pray together. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God, we thank You for today, that this is the day that You've made, Lord. And we thank You for the past 10 years, God, for all that You've done, Father. And we thank You that it was Your yes, Father. Your yes to the greatest sacrifice of all, all of human history, Father. 
to send Your Son to die on a cross so that we could know Jesus, so that we could have new life in Christ. It's Your yes, Your sacrifice, Father, that's the reason we're here, Lord. So we thank You for the privilege of building Your church on the earth, God. We thank You for the honour it is to be part of impacting people's lives for eternity, God. I thank You for every uh, staff member now and in the past, Lord, every yes. dinner party leader, yes. every team member, yes. every giver, Lord, every person who has served in the dark back room, making something happen, Lord, yes. with a video yes, or with Lord. Kids Church, Father. God, You know everyone's name. You know every moment, Lord. You see it all, Father. Yes. And Lord, God, we just I just pray Your blessing upon every person who has sowed into this house to make it what it is, Father. I thank You, Jesus, that that seed is growing into a mighty tree, Lord. Yes, Lord. And I thank You, Father, that it is just the beginning of all yes. You're gonna do, yes, Lord. Lord. So we just thank You, Lord, for partnering with us, God, for wanting to partner with us, Lord, for to inviting us into Your plan, God. Yes, it is such a privilege and an honour, God. We say it's an honour to serve You, Jesus. We thank You for Your grace that goes before us, Lord, Your faithfulness to us. God, we thank You for the answered prayers, Lord, for the miracles we've seen, God, for the families we've seen reunited, God, for the forgiveness that's flowed in this house, God, because of Your blood, Jesus. We thank You, Jesus, for that, Lord. And we thank You for the future, God, that this is just a drop in the bucket of what You're gonna do in our city and in our church, Lord. God, we pray for those that don't know You, Jesus, that are going to come to know You, Jesus, through this house, God, in New York, in Berlin, in Paris. God, the ones that You know their names, Lord, we don't even know their faces or their names, Lord. We pray for them right now, God. We thank You for the children that are gonna be raised in the house of God that haven't yet stepped foot in Your church, God. We thank You for eyes coming alive to who You are, Jesus, to Your great love that is the answer, Father. God, we look away just from ourselves, God. We look up, God. We lift our eyes to the harvest, God. We, God, we say, yes, we'll look out. We'll reach our hands out. We'll see the need, Father. And Lord, we pray, help us to meet it in Your love, God. So we thank You for what You're gonna do, God. We thank You that the church, God, cannot be defeated, Lord. We thank You that Your power lives in Your church, God. We thank You for Your body at work in this city, God. We thank You, Jesus, that the future is bright, God. In Jesus' Name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 If you'd be so bold, just to put your hand on your neighbor's shoulder, I want you to pray for the individual next to you. Remember being present right now. You have living water and you can just speak life, speak the love of God over them. So let's pray for the person on the right or the left of us right now. Lord, we thank you for each and every heart, each and every soul matters in this place. Whatever they need right now, if it's physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing, God, whatever they need provided right now, we believe that You are the fount, that they would look to You, Jesus, that You are the source that they're looking for. We thank You, Jesus, right now. If there's discouragement, courage would rise. If there's insecurity, confidence would come in Jesus' Name. Lord, if there's despair, we thank You for hope. Lord, if there's depression, we thank You for joy. Thank You, Lord, for what everyone needs in here comes from You, Lord. God, You are the bread of life and You are the source of life. You are more than what we're looking for. Your love is beyond the skies, Lord. It's beyond comprehension. So right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray for a greater level of Your love to pour into every heart right now. Thank You, Jesus, right now for forgiveness to flow into every life, into every marriage and relationship. We thank You, Jesus, that today marks a line in the sand that we cross over into being the fount, into being people of God that have the rivers of life, rivers of living water by your Holy Spirit. Right now I pray for a prayer language to rise up. Lord, for people in the gifts of the Spirit to rise up. We thank you for the fruit of the Spirit to rise up because we are connected and tapped into 
to your source and your water. We thank you, Lord, we'd be trees planted by streams of living water, bearing fruit in and out of season in Jesus' name. We thank you for this church and all the people that are represented in this, in this moment and in this room. We thank you, Lord, their families would be blessed. Those that don't know the Lord in their world, that they've been praying for salvation, they would come to know you, Jesus. Some this week, maybe some in a year, but Lord, you, by your grace, would touch their families and their kids and their relatives and their friends with the love of Christ. Help us to be unashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. You are the fount. Thank you, Lord. Help us to be this kind of church in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Come on, let's give God some more praise. Come on, come on. Let's worship Him. Let's glorify Him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So a few updates as we close. Make sure you get your ticket for Vision Builders this Friday. It's going to be unbelievable. It's worth the investment of both time and effort to be there. And you won't be sorry because we're going to head into a new season of Vision. And we get to actually partake being a part of the people that make that building happen. So this Friday, we'll see you there. And next Sunday, back to Manhattan and Brooklyn venues. So uh, make sure you don't come back to the Palladium uh, unless, unless you want to buy it for us. Um, so we'll see you back in Williamsburg and in Manhattan, uh, John Jay Theater and also Music Hall. If you're new, Brooklyn Steel. Oh, sorry. Ryan wants a bigger venue. So Brooklyn Steel. We'll see you at Brooklyn Steel. But hey, if you're new to church, we're so blessed that you're here. Uh, we'd love to connect more if you're looking for a home church. And uh, we're just so, so thankful that you came to our first week as being found. It's a real honor, a real honor to have you. Let's thank all the new visitors here. We, we're really honored that you're here. And don't forget, vi so Vision Builders this week and then dinner parties will be back. We love you, church. Make sure you get your merch out there. We love you guys. Welcome to Found. God bless.